Nothing gives me more hope for the future than seeing my five grandchildren challenge expectations. They see breakthroughs in technology we can't even yet imagine. But the only way they're going to get a chance to fill all that potential is if we take drastic action right now to address the climate disaster facing the nation and our world. More severe storms and droughts, rising sea levels, warming temperatures, shrinking snow cover and ice sheets. It's already happening. And science tells us that how we act or fail to act in the next 12 years will determine the very livability of our planet. Yet today, President Trump denies the evidence in front of his own eyes, hides climate science produced by his own administration, and actively works to roll back what progress we've already made. It's reckless, it's irresponsible, and it is unacceptable. So today, I'm announcing my plan for clean energy revolution. It outlines what we have to do to meet this challenge head on and how we're going to get there. We're going to invest $1.7 trillion in securing our future so that by 2050, the United States will be 100% clean energy economy. This afternoon, President Biden and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will chat on the phone. Biden's decision to revoke a permit for Keystone XL will certainly be a topic of discussion. It marks the end of a saga spanning more than 12 years over the pipeline meant to carry Canadian crude to the United States. Here's Kate Bolangaro. In Canada, President Joe Biden's decision to revoke the Keystone XL permit just after his inauguration was met with disappointment. This project is particularly important for Canada's oil sector, which is a large part of the country's economy. It's a project that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has been advocating for in Washington to be able to help expand the country's energy markets. It's also very important for the province of Alberta and Conservative Premier Jason Kenney has invested $1.1 billion in taxpayer money into the project in the hopes that Biden would not revoke the permit. This being, however, Biden has been very vocal about his stance on this project since he was vice president under Barack Obama. So while this decision doesn't come as a surprise, it is something that the Canadian government is disappointed about. However, they, of course, respect Biden's decision and they will continue to work with the president going forward on other things they have in common, such as the fight against climate change and economic growth, which is something that both countries are hoping to especially work on given the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on both of the country's economies. California is set to become the first state in the nation to phase out the sale of new gas-powered cars. A ban will go into effect 15 years from now. The state's governor says it's the right move for the environment and for business. Danya Bacchus reports from L.A. Using the hood of an electric-powered Ford Mustang, Governor Gavin Newsom signed an executive order banning the sale of new gas-powered passenger cars by 2035. If you want to reduce asthma, if you want to mitigate the rise of sea level, if you want to mitigate the loss of ice sheets around the globe, then this is a policy for other states to follow. The mandate applies only to new cars. Californians will still be able to drive, buy and sell gas powered cars on the used car market. I think it'll just make common sense to go that way. Nothing can. Uh compete with the sound of a naturally aspirated 6.2 liter V8. Exhaust from cars, trucks and other transportation are a large source of air pollution and California has by far the most cars on the road than any other state. Governor Newsom says his order will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 35 percent and not only will it help the environment, he says the electric car mandate will be good for California's economy. This is the next big global industry and California wants to dominate it. California is already home to 34 electric vehicle manufacturers, including top seller Tesla, which announced plans Tuesday to make cheaper batteries. If other states follow California's lead on zero emission vehicles, it could have a huge impact on the U.S. automobile industry. Danya Backus, CBS News. Los I'm Rosa Corey and I'm from the United States, California. And uh, my topic, what I speak about, is uh, one of the most vitally important issues of our age, and that is United Nations Agenda 21, Sustainable Development. And uh, as I'll be talking about tomorrow, 
It is the inventory and control plan. Inventory and control of all land, all water, all minerals, all plants, all animals, all construction, all means of production, all food, all energy, all information, and all human beings in the world. And this is a plan that was agreed to by 179 nations back in 1992. It's a United Nations plan. It's called the Agenda for the 21st Century. And so many of us around the world think that, um, well, sustainable development, it just sounds so great. Isn't it about recycling and creative reuse and, uh, and creating energy and food resources for everyone? And the answer is no. Hey guys, Alex Newman here with The New American. We are at CPAC and we are with the one and only Mark Morano. Normally we find him at climate conferences and UN clown shows. Today we're here at the conservative meeting. Uh, Mark, one of the things that you've been talking about here is how Putin's war machine has literally been financed by the idiotic decisions made in Washington, D.C. on energy and these things. Tell us about it. Well, it's an amazing thing because the Green New Deal, both in the United States and Europe, has literally led to the rise of, of Putin's economy. Just a few years ago, when the United States was energy dominant, Putin does not have anywhere near the amount of uh, energy resources that he did. As Europe goes pursuing net zero, and there was a story out today in 2019, Boris, um, I keep wanting to say Yeltsin, but uh, Boris Johnson in the UK literally poured concrete into their gas wells, two major fracking wells that would have provided 50 years of gas. Why did they do it? Because it was great headlines to promote UK's commitment to net zero. Yay, we're gonna go net zero. This is happening all across Europe as the European Union slowly destroys the sovereignty of these nations and it goes through and they're all achieving this goal, this utopian vision. So they're shutting down their domestic energy. At the same time, uh, Russia's oil and gas Natural gas, 38% going to Europe as a whole, over 50% Germany reliant on Russian natural gas. So what does that mean? Putin is getting richer year by year and not only wealthier, and he can finance his war machine, but he is now strategically in place to, to wreak havoc on Europe. If Germany cancels the, the new Nord Stream 2 pipeline, is that gonna hurt Russia or Germany more? He has the power, Putin, to now send Europe into a deep recession. Right now, Germany's number one economy, and 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 Russia now is several. I think it's fourth. It has the ability, within very short time, to be the second largest economy if this goes well and, and sort of Putin's gamble pays off. And there's really no reason to think anyone in Europe's going to stop it, or John Kerry's diplomacy, or someone's going to stop it. Come to the United States, 2020, uh, with under President Trump, we had the first time since 1952 Harry Truman president. Energy, not only independence, but dominance. More energy production than consumption, more energy exports than imports. And what's happened is Biden came in, he wanted to jail fossil fuel executives. His energy secretary, Granholm, did a video in 2008, a rap video with Bill McKibben and other climate activists. They're singing on camera. This is our energy secretary singing, gasoline, keep it in the ground, the world is aflame. These are the lyrics that our energy secretary was singing about keeping gasoline in the ground. We gotta leave you in the ground. Gasoline, gasoline, you're driving me insane. Gasoline, gasoline, the world's aflame. Gasoline, gasoline, I found someone new. Someone better, better than you. Biden's energy secretary, Stephen Chu, wanted European-style gas prices. Obama wanted to have energy prices, quote, necessarily skyrocket. So here's the problem. It's not an unintended consequence. This is an intended consequence of green policies. They didn't expect to actually achieve their goals, and now they're living with the results. Skyrocketing energy. One estimate last year with the Heartland Institute, $1,000 per family extra in heating and air conditioning bills just from Biden sending a signal to the marketplace that we're closed for business. A lot of the liberals will push back, and I'll see this. Hey, he hasn't actually said it. We're still doing this. We're still permitting. They're still drilling. A lot of stuff's carrying over, but... 
the energy market is kind of like the stock market. When you come in, when President Trump comes in and says, we're open for business, energy production boomed, prices dropped. When Biden comes in and says, we're shutting everything down, Keystone, Arctic, drilling, fracking, death of a thousand cuts, our Treasury Department's going to now use environment, social governance, essentially standards, and go in and start defunding all energy projects. We are, just, we are saying goodbye to fossil fuels. We're going to end it. I guarantee you. That sends a signal to the marketplace, and that's going to drive prices through the roof. Now the other sleight of hand they're doing, CBS News and the Biden administration are now claiming that all of this is caused by Putin's invasion of Russia. All these energy costs. And keep in mind, a year from now, two years, we may even forget that. You know, this is how they rewrite history in real time. So they're trying to blame all of that on it. This is a unbelievable mess. We created this mess uh, in terms of empowering Putin with our energy policy by shutting down our domestic energy. We've empowered China through rare earth mining. We've empowered OPEC, Iran, and Russia. This is just bonkers. It's almost as if they did it intentionally. It can't be this dumb. John Kerry's the most educated man in the world. How could this have happened? It really is amazing, Mark, and I, I think you're probably correct. Uh, before we let you go, uh, you were at the uh, climate conference, the UN climate conference in Glasgow. We didn't go this year because of all the craziness of the vaccines. But, um, w you know, what's going on now as far as climate policy at the UN level? They're full speed ahead? They are absolutely full speed ahead. The next conference is coming up in uh, Egypt in November. John Kerry, this month, uh, this couple of days ago, according to Associated Press, is wants to have an emergency meeting of a climate summit because his fear is that all the world's focus is going to be off climate change as we deal with Ukraine. And he actually said that uh, this that climate change is the national security threat, and this underscores it. Uh, of course, the climate and, and energy policy is the national security threat. But no, the United Nations is full on. What they're now doing, if you look at a lot of the climate activists on Twitter, social media, they're pivoting and saying, we told you so. Had we gone solar and wind decades ago, we wouldn't be beholden to Putin. We wouldn't need Russian gas. This is our fault for not listening to them. To the point where the Washington Post a few months ago had an article praising Jimmy Carter and saying that had he won a second term, there would be no climate crisis today. I want to repeat that. The Washington Post printed an article saying if Jimmy Carter had won a second term and beat Ronald Reagan, there would be no climate crisis today. So now you know that the media and academia and climate activist elite and government view Jimmy Carter's four years as the model way to fight the climate crisis. And it's actually very apt. High inflation, high energy costs, recession, uh, horrible foreign policy, a weak America, no longer a superpower. You start getting the idea, and I repeat it again, is this by accident? Are these intended or unintended consequences?